All right. So uh, um, I want to dive into uh, some of the techniques that are used in Cardano, but I'm going to keep it uh, at a high level so that everyone here can actually follow. So bear with me. So uh, the, let me start by the general thing. The key problem that we try to solve is that of a uh, blockchain ledger. Right. We want to get some high blockchain ledger. What is that? It's a sequence of blocks that have contents. And people can put their transactions into next blocks that are added to the sequence. All right, so this is our goal. And what all this is about, this uh, decentralized blockchain, is how can we decentralize such a trusted ledger? And doing that has two key challenges. The first one is how can we decide who is going to be the next one that will add a block on the ledger when we decentralize? We have a bunch of parties running it. And the second one is, how can we have everyone agree on the state of the ledger, the so-called consensus problem? And there has been different technologies uh, proposed for solving this problem. Uh, proof of work and proof of stake are uh, probably the ones that are uh, most widely deployed and uh, analyzed. So I'm going to focus on those two here. All right. So uh, very briefly, I know that many of you have heard how Bitcoin works, know what proof of work is, so I'm going to go uh, fast through that. How does Bitcoin, and when I say Bitcoin, I'm just using it as an abstraction of any proof of work uh, 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 blockchain. How does Bitcoin solve the first problem? Who should be in charge of uh, what transaction goes in? And in words, what happens is that uh, the miners the miner that gets to propose the next block is the one that manages to solve a hash puzzle. I'm going to be a little bit more graphical in a slide. So um, this, in some sense, yields a lottery where the miner that proposed the next block, the, the person that, among the persons that maintain the blockchain, the one that proposes the next block, is chosen according to the work that he invests in mining. And that's why we use the name proof of work. So to give you an idea, the way to think proof-of-work blockchains, he says every miner has a slot machine, and he keeps pulling. And every time they pull, they get a random string. Right? Here they get fruits. In Bitcoin, they get random string. So the concrete thing that happens, actually, rather than just having a slot machine and pulling, is that they keep hashing the sequence of the previous block the transactions that they want to put in, and some random value. And they change this random value. So every time they pull the handle of the slot machine, what they do is they put a new random value there. And this new random value every time spits out a new random string. So the miners keep doing that and do it and do it over and over again until someone wins. What does it mean that someone wins? It means that the hash that comes out of pulling the, uh, the handle is less than some target value. By less, I mean it has many uh, tailing zeros, for example. So this means that this miner here won the lottery. And what he does when he wins the lottery? Oh, I should say, of course, that um, since what happens is that they all keep pulling the handle, and this thing spits out random strings, the chances of winning this lottery are proportional to how many times I pull the handle, obviously. So when this guy wins, what he does is he gets to propose the next block. He takes the proof that he actually found a good pre-image, puts it in the block, puts the transactions that he has heard in the block, and puts it on the blockchain. So this is in a nutshell how Bitcoin works. Now, just to make things slightly simpler, um, what we can show is that this individual, this composition of individual lotteries, local lotteries, can be abstracted as a, uh, is a good approximation, let's say, of a lottery that is central, runs, and every, now, every, every few minutes points to some guy that won. So rather than people doing it locally and when they win, they just say, I won, you can think of it as it happens centrally for them. This is a way to abstract it, right? That's not what happens in reality. That's a way to, to, to view this process. And this process is as before, iteratively. So in, the, in one round, this guy might win. In another round, that guy might win. In a later round, two guys might win or three guys. Less and less likely that more guys win, though. All right. 
Um, so, and again, this abstracted lottery chooses the uh, parties to win, chooses the winner, um, depending on how much effort they invest. So this is the, the whole idea under how we choose the next guy to propose the block in Bitcoin. All right, so this solves the first thing. How do we choose the next guy? We, we design this lottery, which makes sure that he's chosen according to the power that he invests, according to the hashing power that he invests. The trickier question is how can we make sure that everyone agrees on this thing? And what's, what's the issue with this thing, right? So this guy that chose posts the, his choice to, to everyone, sends it to everyone, everyone sees it, can verify there, the lot, there's a lot of work in it, can verify that he actually did find a good target. So what's the issue? The issue is that someone might be trying to prevent us from agreeing. And this means he keeps mining locally, and when he finds actual blocks, he doesn't play the honest thing. He doesn't send it to everyone. He just sends it to some parties and not to others. He's trying to confuse people. And this creates forks. And to make things work, actually, even by chance, it can happen that two honest guys, two people that actually run the protocol, simultaneously find a solution. And this will create a benign fork, in a sense. Uh, so, how does Bitcoin solve this problem? What happens is that everyone keeps hashing and hashing and hashing. They get the uh, blocks that they see on the network, and they put them in the blockchain as before, and they always go for the longest chain. So whenever in doubt, whenever they have two chains to decide, they always go with the longest one. Why? Because, the first of all, the longest one has more work, and second, uh, because as long as the majority of the Hashing power is invested to the protocol. We say that it's in honest hands. This majority of the of the of the of the, of the, the majority of the honest guys are going to extend the blockchain faster than the minority, which is not investing in the protocol. In other words, the honest guys that are in the majority will eventually overtake any adversarial chain. Because it grows slower, it has less power, and less, less uh, has investing in it. By the way, apologies for things uh, falling on top of the other. It's uh, the punishment probably of Microsoft for me using a uh, Mac to uh, prepare this talk. So that's a, a PowerPoint issue. All right. So um, this general intuition has been formalized in a number of works in, in uh, uh, um, cryptography and security venues. And I want to give you a very, very, very high-level idea of how this work, these proofs work. So let's assume that this is the timeline of the blockchain. And let's say in the first, uh, in the first let's call it slot, in the first minute of the system, nothing happens. No one finds a, a solution. In the second minute, there is an honest guy that finds a solution. So he pushed, uh, pu pushes his, uh, his block to the blockchain. Uh, then in the, in the third, nothing happens. Then in the fourth, an adversarial guy finds a solution, and so on. Then maybe two honest guys find a solution, and then an honest guy will find again, and so on and so forth. Now, we observe the following. Because the honest guys are in the majority, these single blocks from honest guys, on, on, which I just put above the timeline, are going to be on average more than the ones below. And we're going to call those things helpful confirmations, and I will explain why in a minute. So those guys I'm going to call helpful confirmations and those chances to attack. Why? Because whenever the adversary is given the chance to propose a block, he can do what I said before. He can try to confuse. And the same happens when we have a benign fork, right? The honest guys don't want to confuse, but they end up confusing. Now, the way to prove that Bitcoin achieves consensus is to observe that those helpful confirmations, when the honest guys are in the majority, are on average more than the chance the adversary gets to attack. So if you think of what happens whenever a block is on the blockchain and we want to make sure that we agree on it, it's effectively a random walk which goes with bigger steps towards the block being confirmed and with smaller steps back. So what happens is, you know, I want to see if the block is going to stay and want to see what, how many blocks are on top of it. 
what happens in principle is that it's like it, as if someone walks two steps forward, then potentially one step backward, then another step forward, then maybe two steps backward, but then three steps forward. So it's easy to see that this process is going to eventually, you know, drop me off the stage. And that's what happens in Bitcoin. And this is how we prove that eventually there is many confirmations so the block is stable. So that's Bitcoin, right? We have what we want. Why do we bother? The issue is that Bitcoin requires hashing and hashing and hashing all the time. This means that we are investing a lot of energy into finding the solutions to these puzzles. And uh, there is a number of quotes that, uh, that uh, uh, claim, I don't know if they're verifiable, but they claim that Bitcoin consumes in a day the same electricity approximately as Switzerland. And Switzerland is a small country, but it's not that small. So, um, this creates a danger for the scalability of Bitcoin, right? If it becomes huge, then suddenly it will start consuming as much as Greece, right? What stops it from consuming as much as Germany or bigger countries? And that's a huge issue, right? All right. So, um, this gets us back to our question. Can we decentralize the trusted ledger that I described at the beginning, but now without wasting electricity, right? Without draining Earth from, from its resources. And... Uh, the way, the alternative way that we can do that is by what is uh, known as proof of stake. So let's try to examine the two questions that we had originally for a proof of stake protocol. Again, the questions are who gets to propose the next block and how can we agree? For the first question, we can just look at the solution of Bitcoin to get our answer. In Bitcoin, the person that was proposing the next block was the one that was investing most effort in it. In a proof of stake setting, the internal state of the system defines who that next guy is going to be. So what happens is that the next slot leader, the person that proposes the next block for the next slot, is chosen according to the number of coins that he holds or according to the stake that he holds. So, if we go back to this uh, lottery that we said that uh, the Bitcoin hashing abstracts, um, what happens is that it's a similar principle that we can apply here, but rather than selecting people according to their work, we can select them according to the stake they have. All right? Let's see how we can actually uh, approximate this lottery, similarly to Bitcoin, right? Let's draw uh, an idea from what Bitcoin did. We have people hashing something. We should not hash too many times because then we're going to end up uh, like Bitcoin. And this process should yield one, none, or more winners, the same way as Bitcoin does. Now, the difference in a proof of stake lottery is that what they're hashing is the previous block as before. And then the current slot, or the current time, if you want, and each coin that they have. So what they do is for each of their coins, each of their units of stake, they try to see, did that coin win? No, did my other coin win? No, did my other coin win? Right? So effectively, this means that they hash once per coin. And because for each coin they get one chance to win, this means that their chances to win overall are proportional to the coins that they own. So, the first thing to observe here, which I already said it, is that since I'm not running this thing over different random values, right, I'm running it once for every coin, I don't do that much work. And actually, we can do even less work than uh, uh, one hash per coin. But let's, even this way, we do way less work than what you would do in Bitcoin. The, this is great, right? We're not wasting power. So in every time slot, we're just hashing once. Now, what's the issue, other than my PowerPoint issue, 
is that the contents of the hash, so the coin is effectively I'm hashing my uh, public address. I'm hashing my address, right, the coin address. So this address is public. So there's nothing preventing someone that wants to attack the system from trying to predict who won. He knows everything. He knows, I mean, I want to see who is going to win in two hours. I just run this thing with the different coins. And this, of course, is a disaster, right? So uh, if someone wants to attack the system and can predict exactly who's going to be the next guy that proposes the block, uh, he can go and bribe him, he can uh, uh, do a denial of service attack. There's many things that someone that tries to attack the system can do. So that's not a good idea, but it's a good basis. So what is actually going to happen is very similar to what I said before, but instead of putting the coin, some public information there, the parties are going to put their spending, their signing key. That's what they're going to hash. So we're going to have exactly the same lottery as before. Someone is going to win, and this guy that wins will put the proof that he actually, his key won, that it's less than some difficulty, and post it on the blockchain. Right. This is an issue, right? We cannot do that. The key is known only to that guy. How can anyone verify that this guy won? We need to enable that. So what we're going to do is we're going to have this guy put a proof that he knows a key, or rather the key corresponding to one of his coins, indeed won this lottery. And how this proof works, I'm not going to uh, uh, focus here, but uh, there is a way, a cryptographic way, of getting such a proof without saying anything, without revealing anything about the key itself. So the miners can prove that they, uh, uh, that they won, whenever they do, without revealing anything about their key in a non-predictable way. So um, the tool that uh, gives us this is uh, what is known as a, a verifiable random function. This is exactly a cryptographic construction that uh, um, when it takes a random key, it spits out a random, uh, uh, a random number, a random string, and it allows whoever knows the key to create a proof that the key actually corresponds to the string without saying anything about the key. So um, this is what we call a VRF. And just in passing, I should say that we will use a couple of more uh, cryptographic primitives. Um, all of those can be implemented by standard cryptographic assumptions. Um, the uh, second cryptographic primitive is what we call key evolving signatures. What is the issue here? The issue is that if I corrupt, if the adversary goes and bribes someone on Thursday, he should not be able to change what this guy did on Tuesday. What does it mean, change? It means sign conflicting things corresponding to Tuesday. How do we get that? With what is called key evolving signatures. This ensures that the key I'm going to learn if I corrupt a miner on Thursday cannot help me sign things corresponding to uh, transactions that happen on Tuesday. And the other primitive, which is uh, very uh, delicate to uh, uh, actually implement, but we know how to do it, is a randomness beacon. What is randomness beacon? It's a very, very stupid primitive which just spits out randomness. Despite its stupidity, it's very, very useful because it spits the, the randomness to everyone. Everyone can see this randomness, and this is very, very important. All right. Okay. So. We've solved the, the question of uh, how can we actually decide who proposed the next block in proof of stake. Create a lottery that chooses parties proportional to the stake they hold, proportional to the number of coins they have. Now, again, to the much, much harder question, which is how can we make sure that parties agree? And why is, it, is this question hard? In particular, why is it harder than Bitcoin? And the answer is that it doesn't cost anything to the adversary to come up with any change that he wants alternative. It's, it's free. It's one hash per block. Unlike Bitcoin, where if I want to come up with a chain of length five, I really need to be hashing like crazy. Here, it's nothing. I just evaluate five blocks. 
So this creates big headaches, and there is two approaches that have been proposed to solve it. So here I'm discussing two systems, but there's several systems that use both approaches, but uh, I'm just gonna focus on those two systems for now. The first one is uh, what is used by Algorand, which is a quorum style consensus approach. So what this thing says is that if we have an estimate of parties that are around, then what we can do is we can actually pick a small number of them at random according to their stake. So if the, if the stake is honest in majority, then the small number that we will pick is gonna have a majority of good guys. And then we can run a traditional Byzantine agreement. Uh, I'm oversimplifying, by the way, right? It's not a traditional Byzantine agreement. It's a, 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 a brilliant modification of a Byzantine agreement. But for now, let me just, you know, swipe the, this, this thing under the rug. But uh, there's like a lot of very nice ideas under this uh, uh, Byzantine agreement that is used in Algorand. So, again, by a picture similar to what we did with Bitcoin, what happens is the lottery chooses the slot leader, the way we discussed in a few slides back. And in addition, it chooses a committee of, let's call them slot endorsers. And what is the property? If this committee is chosen proportional to their stake, then if the majority of the stake is in honest hands, the majority of those slot endorsers are gonna be honest. And this is great, because we can do many things in distributed computing if we have honest majority. The simplest thing we can do is, again, we chose this guy to select the next block. Here, and he's right. He's gonna select the next block. And now the endorsers are gonna endorse it. Each of them is gonna put his signature on the block. And that's what we put on the blockchain. How are we gonna verify that this block is valid? Well, we're gonna just wait to see at least a majority of signatures. So if there's like three guys in this committee, we're gonna wait for at least two signatures. So this is the underlying idea of, of Algorand. And you know, I can once again put uh, Homer there and uh, party. It's a really great solution. But there is one caveat. So if you think of the mechanics of a proof of stake blockchain. Unlike proof of work, where what happens, I work, I work, I work, I work, I work, I find something I want to announce to the world because I wasted time on it. In proof of work, in proof of stake, sorry, there is a lottery running externally to me. It's as if someone goes out and says, mm, you won, no, next round, you won, no, next round, you two guys won. So what if you're not there? There, it doesn't cost you anything not to be there, right? So in proof of work, it does. You really work for it. It makes no sense not to announce the block. In proof of stake, you're just chosen by an implicit lottery. Well, you know, why if you, well, what happens if you're for coffee? Why should you be there? Uh, there are reasons, but uh, this is a, a provocative way of saying it. All right. So if we look back to Algorand, then what we get is a fantastic property which is what is known as instant finality or optimal latency. This means that I don't have forks. Forks don't occur, right? Why? Every time a guy or even more than one guy is selected to say what's gonna be in the next block and then the, the committee of endorsers endorses it and it goes in. If the committee has majority, then it's always gonna happen. This is great, right? There's no question about how many confirmations should I wait, no. I see the majority of signatures, I'm done. But what happens is that I need to fix how many endorsements do I need to wait. Remember, I'm choosing a random set. How large should this set be? And how many parties should I wait to sign before I say, yeah, this block is valid? And if I choose, let's say I, I, I wait for T endorsers, right? If I choose T, to be too small, then the adversary is gonna flood me, is gonna actually give me the number of signals that I want on wrong things. Now, if I choose T to be too big, then I'm not gonna go anywhere, right? Because I'm waiting for way too many people. So it's crucial in Algorand 
that the lottery that I'm doing, so the, the committee that I'm selecting, takes into account a, an accurate estimate of how many people are around in the current round. So we win something great, but at the cost of an extra assumption. Now, if we look back at, back at Bitcoin, right? Or what I will from now on just call Nakamoto-style consensus. Bitcoin doesn't have this fantastic optimal finality property, right? We're losing there. Why? We have this property that I need, you know, the more I wait, the more confirmations I see on a block, the more confident I can be that the block is not going to be inverted. And it's always a probabilistic guarantee. This is where Bitcoin loses with respect to Algorand. But Bitcoin does not need to know how many people are around in every round. The guarantee we're getting is that if the majority of the people that are currently around hashes honestly according to what Bitcoin says, then the protocol is going to be secure. It doesn't matter if people come and go. All, all that matters is that the majority of those that are around at every point does what the protocol tells them. So the natural question is, okay, Algorand gives a great solution, but it needs an extra property. Bitcoin gives a solution without this property, but loses a little bit in latency. And now the question is, is this trade-off inherent in proof of stake? So is the fact that I cannot tolerate people coming and going inherent in proof of stake? Or to state the question otherwise, can we get Nakamoto-style proof-of-stake blockchains? And the answer is yes. This is exactly what the Ouroboros family of protocol does. And if you look at it from, uh, from distance, its principle is very, very similar to Bitcoin. There's no committee. What it does is each slot is assigned a leader or more than one or less than one, similarly to how Bitcoin was assigning a leader or more than one or less than one. And this leader just pushes his block to everyone. That's what the protocol does. And similarly to Bitcoin, the idea is that the way to get consensus will be with the parties preferring longest chains. There is an asterisk, which I'm going to discuss uh, um, in the next few slides. But this is the high-level idea. So the high-level idea of proof of stake is what did we learn from Nakamoto consensus? What did we learn from Bitcoin? Let's see if it works in the proof of stake realm. And uh, what I will discuss uh, next is from a sequence of, uh, of, uh, of works uh, with colleagues from uh, University of Edinburgh and uh, IOHK. All right. And I should say that uh, the next uh, couple of slides, I have uh, uh, my colleague Agilos Kajas to thank for, you know, when you see these beautiful, beautiful uh, animations, those are his. All right. So let's see how this is done. And at the same level as we proved how Bitcoin works, and why it's secure, I'm going to argue how uh, this Uroboro, Uroboros line of, of, of uh, protocols work. So, uh, as was uh, stated at the beginning of the talk, Uroboros is the protocol behind Cardano, which is the main cryptocurrency of IOHK. So, what you see here is what's running uh, uh, behind the scene in Cardano. All right. So, let's first do a warm-up. Right. Let's start with an easy case. Let's assume that the stake is static. What do I mean by that? I mean that uh, you know, transactions don't affect the stake. Again, that's just as a warm-up, right? That's not true. Let's see how we would solve the problem then. The idea would be, assume that I start with a Genesis block, which has all the users, all the stakeholders, and how much stake they own. Then, what I could do, and, and also has some randomness, right, as a seed. Then, what I could do is I could keep hashing this block over and over and over and over again, and this would give me 
almost fresh randomness. And I can use this fresh randomness to sample who is going to be the winner in this first slot, who is going to be the winner in the second slot, who is going to be the winner in the third slot, and so on until the end of the protocol. I could easily do that. And what I would get is, you know, if the randoms that I'm getting is roughly, uh, is approximately uniform, approximately random, I would get exactly the properties that I would get with Bitcoin. So I would get uh, each slot being assigned to either no one or just one party or potentially to one party that's not there. And that's how the protocol will evolve. Now, of course, conflicts might occur for many reasons because I might select two parties to, to, to be slot leaders or because someone might be not playing the protocol, might be corrupted. So what I'm going to do is exactly as we did in Bitcoin, take the longest chain rule to resolve these issues. So every party adopts the longest chain he sees. Right. So that's the, the, the very easy uh, uh, setting. What happens if the stake evolves? So transactions, as they move between stakeholders, change the stake that they own. Right? This is the natural scenario. Right? I'm removing the unnatural assumption I made before. And I will simplify slightly the game to say the stake evolves, but people are always there when they should speak. Just for simplicity. I'm going to remove this assumption also in a few slides. Here is where I'm going to use what I said before. We can cryptographically implement the randomness beacon. So I'm going to assume that there is some guy that spits fresh randomness in every slot. And this is not really an assumption. I can implement this guy using cryptography and the, 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 the assumptions of the blockchain. So probably you can't read everything that happens here, but it's very similar to what was happening before. Before, we had the Genesis block generating the entire schedule from the beginning until the end of the protocol. Here, we're going to do the following. We're going to say, hmm, in Genesis, I had this stake distribution. Let me generate the next, say, 100 slots. Who's going to win in the next 100 slots? This is the lottery for a so-called epoch. Okay, at the end of this epoch, stake has changed, right? Transactions. This block includes transactions that spend one coin towards another and whatnot. So stake has changed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the beacon to get some fresh randomness. And then I'm going to take whatever stake is implied by the previous epoch. Stake has shifted, right? So I'm going to take whatever stake is implied. And I'm going to do the same thing I did before for another short epoch. Another 100 blocks. And I'm going to keep doing that. So this is the protocol. It's effectively taking the simple protocol I had before, pretending that the stake doesn't change for a few slots. And then after those slots, seeing how the stake changed, and then pretending it doesn't change for the next few slots. Again, pretend the protocol pretends. The proof doesn't pretend anything. right? The proof is actually generic. And as I mentioned already, we can actually cryptographically implement this beacon. All right. So, you know, the, the elephant in the room, right? So we did this thing. This is, a, this is almost the same as Bitcoin, right? Can we use, again, the longest chain rule? Now, let's look at the analysis we had before, right? If you look at what happens in the protocol, there's something very similar to what was happening in Bitcoin, right? So there is the lottery, which says, okay, in that round, there's the second round, there's going to be an honest guy that pushes the block. Then a few rounds later, there's going to be a corrupted guy that pushes the block. Then a few rounds later, maybe two honest guys, maybe uh, some rounds later, an honest guy, and so on. And again, we have the property that the majority of the things that are above, the unique honest guys, which are helpful confirmations, right? So those things that are above are on average, more than the things that are below. Why? Because who is going to be? This situation is mandated by the stake distribution, and the stake distribution is shifted towards honest guys. We have honest majority. And therefore, more, more often than not, the guys on the top are going to be chosen. 
So can we apply exactly the same argument? No. Otherwise, you know, it would be too simple. And what's the reason? The reason is that those very, very convenient for Bitcoin chances to attack are even more convenient here. Because not only I get a chance to attack and create a new chain as I did in Bitcoin, but I get a chance to attack and create a bunch of new chains and confuse the entire network. So every chance to attack here is a multiple harder to tolerate than the corresponding chance in Bitcoin. Why? Because it's free to create chains, right? Whenever I can actually advance in any fork, I'll do it. So back to the question, can we use the longest chain rule? It might seem not by the, by the previous argument, but yes. The answer is yes. The protocol can be as simple as I described it before, but the analysis is much trickier than the Bitcoin analysis. And I'm going to, in, in three slides, just abstract the, uh, the essence of this analysis. So <clears throat> there's two relevant quantities that play a role in this analysis, and those are the reads and the margin. What is the reads? The reads says, what's the longest lie that the adversary can say, right? We have a schedule of adversarial slots, if we, you know, the adversary knows them, and the question is, what's the longest lie that the adversary can say to an honest guy? So I am an honest guy, I've reached some point, what's the longest suffix of the chain that the adversary can serve me and I'll, I'll accept it. The margin is if you compare the guy to whom the adversary can lie the most to the, the second most lieful guy, to the guy that he can fool with a slightly less uh, uh, length, this is the margin. So what does the margin mean, right? The margin tells us how far are the forks of those two worst fooled guys. And obviously, if I can preserve sustainably a positive margin, it means I can always keep two guys forked. So what the analysis is going to try to prove is that in any executions, in any execution of the protocol, it's very unlikely that I'm going to be able to sustain positive margins. By very unlikely, I mean the probability is almost zero. So this means that I cannot really fork two guys. Again, I'm at a very intuitive level. The analysis is much harder, but uh, bear with me through the end of this argument. So now, what happens is that instead of thinking of this two-dimensional, two, this uh, single-dimension random walk at which we had before, where I'm walking towards confirmations or towards inverting, there is a tension between the margin and the reach. So what I have is I have a 2D random walk between different states of the system, uh, where the two dimensions are the margin and the reach. Now, as I told you before, where I want to be is down here, right? I want the margin to be low. I want always to be safely negative on the margin side. And the, my nightmare is up there. Right? This means the adversary can fork the, the most liable to and the second most liable guys indefinitely. So what the analysis proves is that in this random walk, if I start from this area where it's, we call it volatile, right? I don't know, you know, it's, it's, it's not clear whether it's good or bad. It's somehow forks can appear, but as we're gonna see, they're actually resolved. If I start from this area, then with constant probability, I stay there. With constant probability, I will move to the nice area where the margin is negative. So at that point, I have actually uh, full confirmation of a block. And with very, very, very low probability, I'm going to move to the hot area. And if I move to any of those two areas, the walk is going to stay there. It's never going to leave. But it's never going to come here, almost never going to come here. And with constant probability, every time, in every step I'm making, I'm jumping here. 
And whenever I come here, I'm stuck here, which is great. Being stuck sounds bad, but it's amazing for us. That's where we want to be. Once I jump in here, I stay there. All right. <clears throat> so um, how about dynamic availability? And what's the issue with dynamic availability? The issue is that parties might not know what's happening in the, in the, long, in the, in the, in the blockchain. So it could be that I just joined the protocol, which has started uh, years ago, so I only know the Genesis block. So the adversary can serve me a bunch of fake chains, the so-called long-range attack. So you know, that's the last block I knew. I'm now many, many uh, hours later, and the adversary serves me this chain. This is the actual honest chain. I don't know what to choose. And if you look at it, those chains actually have the same number of blocks. So longest chain won't help me. And actually, the adversary can play this attack. Unfortunately, there are ways in the proof of stake protocol that the adversary can actually serve as longest chains. So what we're going to do is the following. Let me, because I don't have time, let me just uh, describe it graphically. If I have a fork, I have two chains, right? If those chains fork too far in the past, more than k blocks in the past, then I won't, I won't use the longest chain rule because I am effectively suspecting a, a long range attack. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the point they forked and compare them with respect to their density. And I'm going to choose the denser. So if they, the fork is recent, I'm going to use longest chain. If it's very old, I'm going to use density. And very intuitively, why uh, uh, the density works? Well, if the, if the part I'm comparing is kind of stable, then, uh, um, then uh, this means that there's more honest blocks than adversarial. So the adversary can never create a denser block than the actual, a denser chain, a denser history than the actual history. And why not apply the denser chain rule everywhere? Well, because the last K blocks cannot be trusted, similarly to Bitcoin. So with a lot of effort, uh, we managed to prove security of a Nakamoto-style consensus. Uh, you might be wondering, uh, you know, how about other things that Nakamoto can do? Can we do it here? Yes, we can do privacy preserving, Zika style uh, uh, Nakamoto consensus with proof of stake. Uh, um, we can do, we can get rid of the very, very strict synchrony assumptions. And, uh, you know, the question is what more? Thank you. <laughs>